sacred moments. Sacred moments with you. Sacred moments. Yeah. Enter in. Sacred moments. I'm here in this space on this day with you. I'm here in this sacred space witnessing the morning dew. Sacred moments. In voice and in victory, we will share our thoughtful view, conversing and even challenging things we thought we knew. Sacred moments. With a Expectancy and excitement is this time set aside. Won't you enter in with us? And come on, let's take this ride. Riding the waves of wonder and whimsy. We're not here to do silly or flimsy. We're sacred moments. We are here open to listen and engage and converse. You know I'm going to keep the triune God in sight and first. I'm here with you on this holy mountain of meaning, sharing vows and syllables, discussing powerful gleanings. It's sacred moments. With songs and sonnets and poems and prose, this is not just another one of those radio shows. It's sacred moments. It's sacred moments with me as your host, here to clear and create and commune with you from coast to coast. It's sacred moments. Enter. Good morning, audience. Good morning, world. Good morning, America. Good morning, super duper alter ego, super duper producer. (laughs) It's going to be a good day. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) We have some technical difficulties, but it's going to be all right. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes. I know I was thinking that's the, that's the word that went in my head, Wusa. You yeah. know, um, you can plan out, you can have everything organized, you can have everything right in front of you, you can study, compare, prepare, and then all of a sudden technical difficulties will put you back every time. But we are warrior women, so we keep on moving, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what we do. Oh, how was your week? Um, uh, my week was okay. Good. Okay. Good, good. How was your week? Um, this was a, a, a hodgepodge week. I, I um, started off not feeling well for about a week and I started feeling better on Wednesday, but I got a chance to get away with my best friend. Um, we went over to Jersey and we got a nice little luxury room. Well, she got the room because she got it like that room and I slept and I ate and I took a walk and looked at the ocean and that really did help me a lot. Um, So that went well. Um, And then um, it got better. Been busy, busy doing ministry work. um, And we're going to keep it moving. (laughs) We're going to keep it moving. Yes, yes. Um, I got a chance to see one of your children this week. Um, Oh, yeah. um, That's a new business. Yes, yes, yes. How do you feel about that? Um, I'm excited for her, you know, but she's young, so there's True. that. I'll just say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I'm excited for her and I'm proud of her. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that um if you are going to take a lot of chances in your youth, I, and I don't mean bad chances, but you know, try to follow your dreams and your heart because as you get older, um, you know, you tend to slow down, but there's a season of everything. So I wish her much success and I will be probably picking up a couple pounds along the way because of, uh, 
<laughs> because the food is so good. Uh, did you see um, Stephanie Mills and Shaka Khan's verses? I saw some of it. I didn't watch the whole thing. I heard um, mm -hmm. Shaka Khan look like she had some some stuff going on, some issues. <laughs> no, I didn't see it. I'm going to go back and watch it on YouTube. I wonder did anybody in the audience see it because I have heard a couple things that um, one thing that I heard Stephanie Mills um, was very gracious. Mm -hmm. um, she was a friend to her in what looked like a mo moments of distress. And I think that women, I think that's something that we don't often get credit for. Like we always talk, you know, I want to be around a lot of women, but there's a lot of us that got each other's back. And um, yeah. I appreciated hearing that. Yeah. So. Mm hmm. Yeah. So the, um. Uh. Good morning, Anna. I think Brenda saw coming on and carries on and and some others. Good morning, audience. We want to know how your week was. How are you doing? Uh, what plans you may have for the uh, upcoming season? Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up, and you know Christmas and New Year's and Hanukkah and. Uh, <laughs> Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, busy, busy season. So we like to hear um, what's going on there and if anybody's cooking and um, bringing plates to someone in their sixth decade that does a radio show called Sex Money. <laughs> Just trying to hit all the buttons, trying to hit all the buttons. Our, is our, um, yep. how are we doing with our guest this morning? Yep, she's ready. ready she is go. ready? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, wonderful. Um, uh, Sacred Moments radio show. We are blessed again today. We have uh, a guest with us that's going to talk to us about mental and emotional health, especially during the holidays, as we just started talking a little bit about that. And so we're in for uh, a treat of inspiration and uh, education. So we want to um, just invite her to come in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Reverend Sharon White, who is our guest. Um, we're going to have her come on in this morning. Good morning. She's in. She's looking very, very <laughs> lovely. Audience that, that can't see and those on the air, just trust me. She is looking absolutely beautiful with her catching pearls this morning. Love those catching pearls. <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm so th I am doing well. I had a few little computer glitches, it seems, but I am doing well. I'm thankful to be alive. Um, I'm just thankful to God for another opportunity to be in this space and time and prayerfully to be a blessing. Absolutely. And I'm sure you will. I'm going to um, defer now to Alter Ego because we get started generally by asking a quirky question of our guests, just to kind of, you know, woo set the mood, get a little joyous. And and I'm, I'm going to ask her to ask the question this morning. <laughs> okay, so my question I'm, I'm is... A clutch, I'm going to clutch my pearls. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a new one we've been asking. So I want to know if you could eat one meal. If you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? You get to pick three things on your plate. Okay, it would be salmon with um, broccoli and uh, a baked potato. Okay, a baked potato? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Um, did you ever answer the question, Miss Michelle? Did you ever tell us what you would eat? No. What would you eat? <laughs> oh, man, this would be a little difficult for me. If if I could, if I didn't have the capacity to gain weight, ice cream would be on that list. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not. I don't know if you would say it's a food, but it's a mm. dessert. But I could eat ice cream. Um, I probably it would probably be a vegetable because I love vegetables. Um, man, that's a hard question for somebody that, that you know eat like I do. <laughs> Um, a seafood vegetable and ice cream. Well, seafood, vegetable, and ice cream. That is funny. 
Well, that's our question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I always laugh at myself because I can never give like a straight answer. I always have to give a story or something. <laughs> you're a good storyteller. That's, that's a good <laughs> trait to have. I was going to say you're a storyteller, so it stands to reason you would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, we have Linda Scott saying, good morning, Minister White. You're being greeted personally. I guess she doesn't good see morning. the rest of us, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good morning. <laughs> uh, Reverend Doctor and Interim Dean Kimberly A. Johnson says, uh, grace and peace, beautiful lady. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to uh, just read a little bit of your bio. Um, you serve actually with me at the Fellowship of Women Clergy under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Kimberly Johnson, uh, formerly associate minister at First African Baptist Church, um, serving under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Richard A. Dent, quite well, quite well known. Uh, you were the director of the Sunday School and Children's Church, instructor for Bible study, uh, members, member of the Women's Ministry Steering Committee, um, I know you to do many, many workshops for women across the tri-state area. Um, and um, that's something that I've, I've actually sat under your, your teaching um, years and years and years ago um, at Sharon Baptist Church um, when you served there. Uh, you are the founder and facilitator of Women of Word and Wisdom, which is a book club. I love that a monthly non-denominational group that you started in March of 2011. Um, and you have uh, uh, several educational uh, uh, certificates and degrees, a uh, biblical counselor through Christian Research and Development Institute, um, certificates for evangelism through the Coral Ridge Evangelism Explosion Program, as well as the Bible training for church leaders um, and for pastors. Um, oh, wow, you have really a certificate of theology and ministry from Princeton uh, Seminary and a Missio uh, pulpit program. You're licensed clinical, and we're going to get into this part of your cl licensed clinical social worker um, and the director of clinic based services at Meriki. Did I say that correctly? Mary yes, Keith, you sure did. County. Great. You hold a BSW from Eastern College and a Master of Social Studies degree from Bryn Mawr College Graduate School of Social Work and Social Research. You oh. have a lot of uh, background <laughs> in social work, um, in, in uh, biblical counseling, um, and research. And I'm going to ask you to tell us, how did you uh, get into that field? Was it something that was in you inherently or did you just find your way and how, how did all of this come about? Thank you for the question. So I would say that when I was uh, younger, I watched my mother in the social work field and I just was fascinated with this idea of helping people. So I knew I wanted to go into social work. As a matter of fact, I remember my high school algebra teacher throwing the eraser at the board when I told him that I was going to social work. He was like, what do you mean you want to social work? You have a high aptitude for numbers and blah, 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 blah. And I said, oh. I just feel drawn to that. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he was really like a mentor. He was like, what do you mean? And so it was dramatic. But but I got his point that I had, a, you know, a very high math aptitude. I would figure algebra problems out differently than everybody else and it would be the right answer and all these kind of things. But I felt such a pull to people before I even knew mm. my purpose in life. I feel a pull to help people. So I went to Bryn Mawr. I mean, I went to Eastern, got the degree, and I soon got burned out in doing what we call functional social work. And that Ooh. is social work where you're helping people get resources and helping people figure out how to get meals and, you know, services. I got burned out there. But um, at one point, I took the, the Christian Research and Development Program for Biblical Counseling, and that's when the light bell bulb went off and said, this is the area that you are called to. It is to the mental health field. So this is clinical social work versus functional social work. And when I got into the field, I just really, um, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. I really mm -hmm. did. And so I did, I did clinical work for um, direct services for about seven years, I think. And then I moved into a leadership role and have been in that ever since. 
and and okay. recently got the promotion in December to this position I have now. Wow, wow. Um, having a, a love for people and watching your mom do it um, and helping to, I guess I, we forget sometimes as parents and adults that people are watching us, children watch us and we we can be drawn to something when we see someone else operating in excellence and in integrity and in care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, do you mm -hmm. have a specialty of age? Because um, I, since I do know you, you know, I remember when my mom was going through the dementia, I would be calling you and asking you, <laughs> you know, so many questions about, you know, she did this, she did this. What do you think? Am I going to get it? So are you drawn to a particular age group or is it a wide range? It's interesting you ask that question because my mother worked in childcare. So I always thought I was supposed to work in childcare, but I found myself unfulfilled until I got into aging. And when I started specializing in gerontology, I knew that was the area that I was most drawn to. And so even though now as the clinic director, I'm not specializing in aging, I still, 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 still have a passion for uh, gerontology and helping older people. So I still go around and do presentations and things on aging. So yeah, it is definitely aging for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for that because, well, maybe speak to this. I Being in the sixth decade of my life and understanding and seeing things from this perspective, um, it's some, it seems, that some of some of our society looks at seniors as being like a throwaway uh, group, uh, age group. What what would you say about that? Absolutely, it's interesting that you will point that out because I'll tell you, um, I ran. I was the president of a state board, and what we found was in the human services field, people shied away from aging. They wanted to focus on childcare and families, but they didn't want to deal with aging. And so what I, what I believe is happening is multiple things. One, sometimes people are too close to aging issues because of family situations, parenting issues, and things like that. So they can't tolerate this idea of working in the aging field or even paying attention to aging issues. And then I think the other thing is that as a society, we present uh, the public appeal is always to new and young and beautiful and you know mm. vi vi vitality and you look at all the commercials you see do you ever see any commercials i mean i've seen a few here and there but most of the publicity is about youth and you know keeping that finding that fountain of youth by putting on more makeup and you know so i think society has helped us to really um just dis discount the value of our elders um so that's what i would say i appreciate um the heart that you have for uh, you know, those of us that are aging. And I do know in living it out that um, I always say I, my spirit is 44. I don't know where it seems like that's the, the, the number that I have inside that is um, still vibrant and, and in my head, in my head, my body feels exactly my age right now, but you know, inside I feel uh, very youthful. Um, of think of mind of thought and um, very thankful to have lived, um, you know, the years that I have lived. I'm thankful so, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, I have a, I have a, a question though. I, well, not really a question, more so a statement that would about what you said about how the appeal is to the younger um, audience because we with our nonprofit. So um, a part of our podcast, um, the bigger scope is. Um, besties building brands and we kind of like bring business owners together and help them grow their business and we've been trying for two years now okay to get this senior writing initiative off the ground and wow. we want to just send letters to the seniors around the holidays because i mean i know we're going to talk about that later i just had the feeling that you know sometimes people outlive their family and they're alone on the holidays and maybe, or maybe their family just doesn't come and get them. So I'm like, it would be cool if they could start getting letters around the holidays. You could just write them throughout the year, like an actual letter 
Um, and we get like two, three people. And it's like, that's so crazy. But if I put together a children's program, hey, let's give the kids some, some coats and some book bags. Everybody's like, here, let's donate. So it's it's sad to me. And I don't know if it's because my mom and Miss Michelle and you guys, I'm thinking about you like, and then with my health issues, like what if something happens to me? I'm my mom's only child. Well, my kids, you know, make sure my mom is okay. I don't want her to be lonely. Mm-hmm. And it's just like nobody focuses on that. Everybody wants the shiny new, you know, youth programs and tech programs. I'm like, why can't we teach the seniors how to use the computer so they can FaceTime their family, mm-hmm. you know, in mm-hmm. another city? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. like I said, it was more of a statement, but I feel like that's true. And I'm going I'm to keep trying. Um and that's why these shows are important, just to keep putting the message out there to let people know, like, our, um, you know, our senior saints are important and they have a lot of knowledge so, to share. So can I share a couple things with you about that? I think that's very um, uh, insightful um, about the fact that many older people are alone, even when they have family members. And I remember when I was providing direct service, one of my clients said to me she was disabled. So her um she couldn't go to the supermarket on her own so she said to me and this was a very poignant statement um she said i'm very lonely she said when my daughter comes to visit me it's when she comes once a month to do my grocery shopping she doesn't Mm -hmm. take me with her because i'm too slow so she takes the list she takes the money she goes shopping and if she has time when she comes back she'll put the groceries away if she doesn't she leaves them and that's the extent of my visit with my daughter And Mm. so I said, whoa, no wonder she's lonely. And so a a lot of other clients said the same things to us. These were particularly people who were homebound. But the Mm -hmm. good news is that, um, and I think, you know, we may want to talk a little bit more um, uh, offline if you like, but I think the other piece is that there are senior centers all over. Every county has senior centers. And if you really want to do some partnership, um, it would be great to connect with the senior centers because Many of them do have computer classes for older adults. Um, Many of them do have um, services and maybe just maybe partnering with them around that letter writing card sending would be phenomenal. I think the other thing that I'm always interested in um, is doing some intergenerational work. So maybe having high school kids write letters to the older adults in the area, you know, doing a school project with with a school where they adopt a a senior center and begin to do some socialization with the uh, older adults. So I think there's some opportunities. And again, I'm happy to talk with you offline if you like. Yeah, sure. We, um, that's something we were looking into, um, to try to get off the ground either before this year is over or next year. Mm -hmm. Um, because I also feel like, um, you know, a lot of things happen around the holidays and during the rest of the year, like you said, just a regular, Wednesday in March, you need groceries <laughs> and nobody is there to Absolutely. help you because, you know, you got your turkey for Thanksgiving, you maybe got a basket or something for New Year's and then nobody cares about you till the next holiday comes up. So you could definitely um, talk about that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that, I think um, what's really important. I'm uh, sorry. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I think that there are services that people are not aware of is what I want to point out. So Mm -hmm. if if I could give one really good piece of information about aging is this. Every county has what's called an area agency on aging that is funded by federal and state dollars and some other monies. Every county has one. Philadelphia County, Delaware County, every county has a, a triple A, which is mandated by the Older Americans Act. So they are the hub of all things aging services. And a lot of people don't know that they exist and that they are available to provide many services. They're not a hundred percent, you know, meeting every need, but they provide a lot of services based on a mandate by the older Americans act. So I just wanted to point that out there and it's easy to find them. You, you can uh, search it on the web or whatever, but area agency on aging is what people want to look for to know what exactly is available in every County. Thank you. We'll, we'll try to get that and post it, you know, sometime today on our this page. So as we're talking also about the holidays coming up, um, incorporating not just seniors, but all of us, um, and in your field of um, 
social work and um, mental health. What what normally happens? What do you see normally happening around this time? And how can we be aware of uh, the needs of us that may be going through emotional or mental stress, especially during this season? Sure. So what we see is a lot of loneliness. We see a lot of uh, depression, um, either connected to being alone or being connected to losing a loved one so that that person is not available now during this, what most people see as a celebratory time. Um, we see some a lot of anxiety also around um, issues of need, um, limited resources, how that mm. impacts a person's self-worth um, during a season when everybody's talking about giving and buying and all that, and your, your nickels are rubbing together very uh, uh, limit, in a limited way. So we see a lot of anxiety, grief and loss, resurfacing, re, re, um, resurfacing of the grief issues about somebody who may have even um, passed away five years ago. So grief on top of grief on top of grief. We see that as an, a big issue also. So those are the things I would say, grief and loss, loneliness, depression, anxiety. How would a person, what would you say would be helpful to a person when they start feeling some, I, I'm going to say some kind of way, because sometimes mm -hmm. we don't always know what it is. Right. We're not aware. We just know that we're we're off our game or off our square or we're sleeping a lot or we're eating. You know, something is out of whack. What what, mm -hmm. what things should we look for? And, and maybe what could you help us with? It? What, what should we do? So I think we one of the things that we do in the mental health field is first ask people to check in with their physician to make sure there's nothing metabolically ha metabolically happening to cause the depression because there are many things that can. So we always say, start with the physician. Your physician, if you had that person over a period of time, they know your baseline, emotionally, psychologically, right. all that. So start there, um, meet with them, just let them know how you're feeling. The thing that's really critical is not to hide it, not to sweep it under the rug, not to act like it's okay to not feel well. Um, it's just not okay to not feel well because there is help out there. So I actually, I would like to say that again to everybody listening. It is not okay to feel unwell and stay there. So start with your physician, have a checkup, make sure there's nothing, uh, psycho I'm, excuse me, um, biologically going on. If your physician rules that out, let's talk about getting a therapist just to have what we call an intake assessment. It is, um, there's not, there's absolutely everything right about doing that if you're not in a good place. So go find yourself a therapist, get an assessment. That first interview is where the therapist will, it will make it very clear to you what symptoms they're hearing from what you describe. And then they will talk with you about a plan of action. Here's the good news. Most people's health insurance has a behavioral health benefit. What that means is there's a member service division that will, will be able to to provide you with the therapists who are paid by them to provide your care. So I say, take your insurance card, look on the back, look for member services, and then sometimes they break it out and say behavioral health. But if they don't, call the main number and say, I need an assessment. I'm having some issues that I think I need a therapist. Please provide me with a list. And they will do that. So that's the easiest way. Sometimes people just start calling agencies, but the problem is that agency may not be uh, paid directly for you to get the care. So then you're paying out of pocket unnecessarily. Mm. So that's what I would do. Um, if you have a church, um, a, a ministry at your church that has a counseling ministry, go there as a start. Let me just throw a word of caution. Every um, church counseling ministry is not equipped for serious mental health issues. But you can start there also to see if what you're experiencing is acute and they can help you work through it. So those are the things I would say. I wanna make sure that we are um, really open to taking care of ourselves holistically. Yes. And so I wanna stress that, and particularly in our communities, sometimes we shy away from uh, seeking mental health care. And I wanna say, if you come your arm you would not stay at home and say oh well 
you will go to the hospital to get some care. I want to say it's just as important when you find yourself depressed or grieving uncontrollably, un un unable to manage it yourself. It's equally important to go see a therapist and take care of what your issues are. It doesn't mean that you're crazy. People use these words that are very off-putting and yeah. they, they really stigmatize mental illness. There's, there's nothing crazy about having a depression. There's nothing crazy about having anxiety. It is absolutely, here's what I'm, I'm going to use the word crazy. It's crazy to sit and suffer when you can get some help. That's what I want to say. It seems like it's, it's it's like a stigma in our community, though. We, we did a whole show about that, too, about the stigma of mental illness in the black community and why we don't go get help. Um, and I just do you have any insight on why that is, why it's so mm. difficult for us to go get help? Yeah, I mean, I think the issue is, again, the stigma, the idea that there's something wrong with me if I need to get some help from somebody else. And here's the other thing. Um, our family history stories haven't haven't served us well when we when we say things like keep your family business in the house don't tell outsiders your business all those kind of things also keep us from seeking out help we think we have to do it all we think we have to um be it all uh, um without seeking out professional help there's something for some reason that feels off-putting about telling a professional that you need help so the stigma is real but let me give you some statistics all right so I am what I am a mental health first aid trainer, which is an international program that trains people how to train the non-professionals on mental health issues. So I'm certified in older adults, uh, uh, high school, and one other group I can't remember. Anyway, so so the statistic says that every day in this country, in the world, actually, twenty percent, at least twenty percent of the population has a mental health issue. Largely, anxiety is the number one mental health issue. Depression is number two. So that's a big number. And so it stands to reason that we have to become advocates for people in shows like this to say, do not be ashamed to go get some help. Let Wait, somebody you, know you're suffering. Can you back up for a second? You said anxiety sure. is a mental health condition? Yes, anxiety is the number one mental health condition in this country. People think it's depression, but it's anxiety. Depression is number two. And um, anxiety, well, you you know, as a professional, you speak to this because I have suffered with anxiety. I've had panic attacks over, you know, the span of my life. Um, seasonal anxiety disorder, which, you know, happens in this season for different reasons. But I really appreciate the fact that you're taking the shame out of it. There's no shame to it. It is a condition that we can be healed and helped with. Is that what I'm hearing you to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what, sis, I'm on a, I'm on a mission to try to merge even ministry, church ministry and mental health, because I want to help the church to understand mental illness better and to support people as they go to get some some help rather than making people think that you can pray your issue away. I am a firm believer in prayer. I pray on multiple ministries, but I also understand that there are some issues that we need live bodies to help who have expertise and training to help us work through those issues, whether it's solely psychotherapy or whether it's psychotherapy and medication. So that's one of my heart's desires. And I'm trying to, uh, I'm really trying to figure out how to, how to move through that while I'm still working. But that's my passion is to merge and help to um, really destigmatize mental illness in our community. And, and I think what's so awesome is that there are, so I, I was asked by some millennials about a month ago to come and present on mental health issues with them. And it was amazing because these young people wanted to know, they wanted to understand, they talked about having friends who, who were depressed and what to do with it. And I spent probably, it was supposed to be an hour. I, I, I stayed there as long as they wanted me to, and it was probably two hours. And those young people were so energized to say, um, they re so I said to them, each one of you has the capacity to shape and change somebody's view of mental illness just by the people in your circle. So ask me anything you want to ask me because when you leave me, 
I want you to be able to help people to stop labeling people with mental illness um, and to help people to know that it is okay to seek out help and it's actually wise to do that. And by the way, you asked me earlier about what also stigmatizes us and is labels. People label people with mental health issues and that also keeps people from wanting to go get help. We have to stop the labels. My mantra all everywhere I present, I say labels are for boxes and jars and, and um, bags. They are not for people. Let's stop mm. calling people schizophrenic. No, she has schizophrenia. Mm. Let's, mm. let's stop. Oh, okay. He's not autistic. He's not autistic. He has autism. Okay. Mm. So we, we won't, that, that's also what stigmatizes people though. It really mm -hmm. is. Um, Jackie said questions to ask ourselves is what happened to me rather than what's wrong with me. Language is so important. Um, Absolutely. Charmaine Absolutely. said that she suffers from um, seasonal depression, but is there a such name as name for trigger depression? I, I, I've been in this field for a long time. I've never heard the language trigger depression. I have to be honest with you. There are things that can um, cause depression, but I've never heard that language trigger depression. There is again, the season, the seasonal depression, um, there's acute depression, which is a depression that is usually short term. Then there is mm -hmm. chronic depression, which is a lifelong depressive um, uh, state for somebody who usually then needs medication to work along psychotherapy to understand their triggers for their depression, to be able to realize when they're starting to um, have some of the symptomology. Because if you can understand your symptoms and if you mm -hmm. can understand when you're starting to get depressed, the work. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the immediate time that you recognize it can be what keeps you from going into a full-blown blown depressive um, uh, situation where you can't function and all those things. So we try yeah. to teach people in therapy, what, what are your symptoms? How do you know when you're starting to become more depressed? And let's work on it. Let's come up with a plan um, for that. As people have been talking about depression a lot lately, I feel like all the kids are saying they're depressed. Everybody is depressed online. Everybody is sad. Um, and it definitely needs to be more education around it. I know um, for me, I don't know if it's seasonal depression or just grief, but for I hate Christmas music. OK, everything. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday after Thanksgiving. Like I'm really the Grinch, but I pull, you know, the spirit out the Christmas cheer for the kids. Um, mm -hmm. and I had to realize a few years ago, like because this it's always funny, like, oh, no, mommy hates Christmas music. Um, but I didn't always, and I had to remember why. Um, why do I hate Christmas music? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, my brother got killed in November. Um, and it's just like, and it's weird because his birthday is the 18th. I don't get sad on the 18th. Thanksgiving comes up. I don't get sad. But as soon as I hear the OJ's Christmas music, I'm like irritated and upset and mad. And I realized that it's because of that. Like, I just missed him that Christmas. And every mm -hmm. year, I feel some type of way about it. Um, but because I'm black and I'm a woman and I have kids, you know, I can't. How are you going to be sad on Christmas? You know what I mean? So it's like mm. you have to pull mm. it out. You have to smile. You have to. And I realized I was overcompensating. Like, I will buy, if they like Blue's Clues at the time, I will buy every single solitary Blue's Clues so that they... Mm -hmm. wouldn't be sad like I was mm -hmm. and a lot of people mm -hmm. really don't realize what they're doing you don't realize that the mood that you're making and the decisions that you're making um is based off of that um yeah so I I want you to let's see so she said that she suffers from depression um I know Miss Michelle had another question but I don't want to forget like if people need services do you offer any services? I know you said they can look on the back of their car, but is there any way if somebody wants to talk to you, they can contact you? So because of the position I have now, I, I'm not able to do direct service any longer. I'm my, my position as the director of our clinic. I, I, I am the director of one of the largest clinics around and the largest one in my company, which means I'm serving thousands of clients. And so my job to administrate that um, just doesn't allow me to do direct service any longer. Um, I I do a lot of workshops and presentations and things like that to help people to know how to get help and what to do and all of that. But I I can't take that on. But again, I, the best way to get help is either your member services because then you're assured.
So there's a thing called capitation, right? With insurance, capitation. Capitation means this insurance will pay for these providers. If you don't go to one of those providers, it's going to either cost you more or it's going to be hard to get services. So the best option is to go through member services in your insurance. Now, here's the other thing. Every county has an office of behavioral health. Every county does. And they, we, we call it OBH, but every county has an office on behavioral health. So you can also call them for a list of providers because they fund what we call base service units in every county. So for example, my organization is one of the base service units in Delaware County. So we get monies to take care of people who don't have health insurance. Then Crozier is the other base service unit in Delaware County. So between the two of us, our organizations, we will provide psychiatric care, psychiatrists, and um, mental health case management and therapy for people who do not have insurance that will cover it. Um, so that's another option. So the two that I've pushed are your Office of Behavioral Health. They have a whole list of providers. Um, they break it down by who has psychiatrists, who has um, group services, who have support services, support groups, and then again, your insurance. Those are the two quickest, easiest, most efficient ways to get the proper help. Wow. Um, these uh, very impactful and important shows, they always go too fast. I mean, you know, we could be talking for hours and hours and hours, but I do think that you gave us some really good um, points to ponder, to consider, um, to think about no shame, in mental health issues, get the help. There is help um, available. Um, we didn't we didn't talk as much about the faith issue, but we know that our faith plays a role in healing because Jesus said, "I come to give you life and life to the fullness. I come to give you abundant life." We know that yes. the Lord is a divine healer. But we also know yes. that the Lord, that that we can be healed through medicine, holistically, counseling, all the ways. So we want to make sure that our audience hears that there's no stigma. Our language is important. I'm I'm trying to remember all the things that you said. How we no labels, no ourselves. labels, no labels. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. and to to know our triggers and to be honest with them. To be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, and to um, work at what it is that we can do to get healed, just like we would if we broke our arm. So this this uh, conversation, we're going to post it. We hope that other people will will see it sometime today and later on in the week as we approach this holiday season. Um, uh, Missy is asking, can you post the different contact points? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that and, and get that posted, uh, hopefully by the end of the day. Um, and we may have you back on again to talk a little bit more um, because your um, presentation was very, very well needed. Um, mm -hmm. Reverend White does workshops and she may not be available for one-on-one, -on -one, but you are looking to do more workshops to help us have a better understanding of mental health. So if you are interested in having her come to your organization, your church, uh, we want you to reach out to her. Her name is Reverend Sharon D. White. Um, she is on Facebook. Um, we will get her contact information and we'll post it. <laughs> Charmaine is saying, please have a part two. Um, and so we'll- I we would will, love we'll, to, I would love to. We, we are, I would we love are to. I, trying to have you back um, possibly before the end of the season. But if you're out there, we want you to get help. We want you to know no shame, no labels. This is a good thing because once we get healed, we can help heal somebody else. Amen. I want to ask you to close Amen. us out with a very quick word of prayer because I believe that the Lord has placed that on your heart to pray for us and pray for this community, pray for the listeners in the way that God leads you. And after you pray, we're going Amen. to say God bless everybody. See you on Friday at Sacred Space Ministry and have an absolutely wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, I Amen. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And I have really enjoyed being with you all today. And I look forward to coming back again because it is important. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as once again, we come in your presence, God, wherever we are, if you're inside of us, we are in your presence. We thank you, God, that you are a big God and you're so big and so uh, awesome and so great that you can look at all of our needs at the same time and meet each and every one of them. Father, we thank you for this time of information sharing, of truth sharing, of dispelling myths and sharing uh, just a little bit about mental health issues to try to help us to be better with uh, reducing shame and stigma, to help us to be better with uh, reaching out for help. God, I pray for every listener on this call today, every person who saw or heard this time of information sharing, I pray for them, Lord, that if any of them are struggling with depression, anxiety, any other mental illness, even suicide, God, I pray that they would not suffer in silence, but that they would be willing to reach out to the the professionals, their MD, somebody who they trust to walk alongside them as they get the help that they need. God, we know that this is a season where people are in distress. God, I pray covering over each and every person Mm. on this call. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that they would go through this season not masking their issues but and and not having to uh, uh, be ashamed about them, but that they will reach out and say, I'm not in a good place help me somebody, and that they will reach out to the resources we provide that they might get the help that we need. God, we know that 20 to 25% of the population at any time suffers with mental illness. That's a big thing. And we need to be intentional, oh God, about helping people to feel better. Now, God, we know that you're the great healer, though. We know that you can heal mental illness however you choose. You might choose medication. You might choose a therapist. You might choose to do a supernatural, but God, we lay this whole mm. issue in your hands at your feet, God. Uh, look, yeah. God, you, you asked the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be made whole? And you didn't take excuses from him. You told mm. him to take up his bed and walk. He had a part to play in getting his own healing. Remind every listener today, God, don't settle for laying by the pool wounded, but determine in your own heart and mind, I'm not going to stay in an a, a unhealthy, unsafe space. I'm going to reach out and get the help that I need. We thank mm. you again for this space and time. We thank you for Reverend Horton and uh, uh, Khadijah, Lord God. And we just thank you for their um, efforts to reach the masses about important information. Have your divine way today, God, in our lives. In Jesus' name, you, yeah. amen. Oh, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Audience, we love you. Until we see you again on the next show. Peace and blessings. Bye.